90% of my liquid net worth is basically allocated right now to Solana. I moved some from ETH. I don't have much Bitcoin right now. Doesn't mean I don't like Bitcoin. I just think the others go up more. Simple as that. I own a bunch of high-end NFTs that I think I have another thesis about. And then beyond that, I do a bit of speculation and other stuff for the fun of it. But the time horizon thing is I can see it freaks everybody out. And I've set back and it was only in the last two weeks I've realized the risk, the, the, the real thing that's going on on crypto Twitter and why the banana zone resonates and why you get this backlash is this is everybody's hopes and dreams. It's, it's everywhere. It's yours. It's mine. It's everybody's. Right, so they're so scared of it going wrong, yet they're some, so greedy to get it right. This is the struggle that everybody's having. Mm -hmm. And people have PTSD from the last cycle, as the people did from the previous cycle. Right, the previous cycle was the blow off top, and then the collapse. This one was the stunted top, and then the collapse. And so now people, they worry about the cycle. Mm -hmm. I don't remember Jeff Bezos caring about the business cycle. He just owned his... In a recent interview, Raul Pal, CEO of Real Vision, advocates for focusing less on current market cycles and more on owning significant cryptocurrencies. Pal reveals that 90% of his liquid net worth is allocated to Solana, having shifted investments from Ethereum while holding minimal Bitcoin. This isn't a reflection of disinterest in Bitcoin. Rather, Pal sees assets like Solana offering greater appreciation potential presently. He notes the emotional investment within the cryptocurrency community, driven by fear of failure and greed for success. Pal advises adopting a long-term perspective akin to Jeff Bezos' strategy of holding on to stock regardless of business cycles, advocating for sustained commitment to investments. In other news, Coindesk reported on investors seizing the opportunity to buy Bitcoin after a sharp decline post-July 4th break. Bitcoin's price plummeted over 10%, from nearly $61,000 to under $54,000 early Friday. In response, investors poured funds into Bitcoin exchange-traded funds, resulting in significant inflows totaling $43. 19 million on Friday, the highest in at least two weeks. Notably, Fidelity's Wise Origin Bitcoin Fund attracted $7.4 million in net new investments, alongside other ETFs like Bitwise Bitcoin ETF, ARK21 Shares Bitcoin ETF, and Vanek Bitcoin Trust. Here are some clips from Raul Pell's insightful interview. Stop, you don't have time. Don't miss out this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself first ahead of the crowd. We have created the ultimate step-by-step -step crypto cheat guide that will guide you this bull run. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Now, by clicking on the link below to get your exclusive copy just under $10. I don't trade anything in macro really anymore. Um, my personal portfolio is pretty much, well, it's 100% crypto. The, uh, you know, within Global Macro Investor and Real Vision Pro Macro, there are some technology bets and other bits and pieces around that because it's all part of the same trade. What I found over this process was that everybody in macro had been struggling for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. the, the odd trade came along, like the buy bonds where diamonds trade, you can make a <laughs> ton of money on it. But there was, people were struggling because we didn't understand the world. Equities just kept going up and we just couldn't get our teeth into anything because we weren't looking at the right thing. There was a mega trend going on, which was this liquidity cycle. And once you saw it, you realized that everything was correlated to it. So if everything is correlated to it, then it becomes interesting to say, okay, well then, if it's all the same trade, what's the best performing asset? Now, the other really important thing, what I think has happened, and it took me too long to realize this, I'm annoyed at myself, is that the Federal Reserve and all the central banks took, uh, took away left tail risk. Left tail risk in a global macro view really is a debt deflation, which is when your, the value of your collateral falls too much that you can't pay for the debts and it gets called upon. And people sell the collateral and you get into this cycle. We had that in 2008. What did they do? Debase the currency. What did it do? Optically make asset prices rise. So the collateral went up. The Europeans did it even harder in 2012. So what they've said, and then we did it again in COVID. So what they've said is, you cannot have a debt deflation. We will not allow it. And we will debase the currency by 8% a year to pay for it. Think of that as a put option that you're paying on the system not blowing up, which is a very different way of looking at it, as opposed to, hmm. I can't believe they're robbing me of 8%. If you say, hey, listen, it's a mutualized cost of a put option, and we all pay 8% so the whole system doesn't blow up. Okay. So if we've taken away the left tail, and everything is correlated on this debt refi cycle, and they have to debase currency over time to do it, 
well, this may well be the best macro risk-taking opportunity of all time. Mm-hmm. And then when you just break it all down, what I did simply was to, was divided all of the main assets by the global liquidity or even the Fed balance sheet, whatever measure you want to use, M2 doesn't really matter. Nothing else goes up except the NASDAQ and crypto. Mm -hmm. And the NASDAQ since 2011 has done 17% a year returns and Bitcoin's done 150. So you're like, holy shit. Okay, it kind of makes a mockery of anything else you invest in. Everything becomes suboptimal. So then people go, yeah, but what about the risk return, the volatility? That 150% return is after three 80% drawdowns. They're included in that number. Oh, and the longer time horizon you take it, the more ridiculous it is. It's an alien asset class. We've never had anything like this. So I got to the realization too late that this there is only one trade. And people hate it. People hate the fact that there's one trade and it's a new asset class. And they, they want it to return to the old days. They want to trade oil and they want to trade dollar yen and they want to trade them like all irrelevant. If our job as investors to maximize our profits or protect our wealth, okay, wealth preservation may be marginally different, but if we're profit maximizers, then you owe it to yourself. Because if not, every other trade is suboptimal because there's no, there's no benefits of diversification. Zero. Pal explains that traditional macro traders have faced challenges over the past decade. While some trades, like buying bonds or commodities, have been successful, many macro investors have struggled to find profitable opportunities. This difficulty stems from not focusing on the right factors. He points out that continuous currency debasement by central banks serves as a form of insurance against economic collapse. This debasement inflates asset prices, supporting the financial system but eroding the value of fiat currency over time. On the other hand, Pal acknowledges that many investors remain resistant to focusing solely on cryptocurrencies. They prefer trading traditional assets such as oil and currencies. However, Pal argues that this mindset is outdated. He believes investors should prioritize maximizing profits, which in today's context means considering investments in cryptocurrencies. Now, let's return to Raul Pal's insights on this matter. I noticed that Yellen went to China twice. Right, well, what's she doing in China? It's something to do with their debt refinancing cycle because they need dollars because their entire property sector is a dollar borrower, right? So they've got a dollar shortage. There's a global dollar shortage going on. It started Silicon Valley Bank, all of that, rolls into Credit Suisse, blows out Credit Suisse, big part of the euro dollar market. Then the Japanese banks, they're the epicenter of the euro dollar market. What's happening is they're they're starved of dollars. So dollar yen starts falling. Um, and then Yellen goes to China twice. So Yellen needs to orchestrate this little dance. The dance is using Japan to scare the Chinese to do something. The Chinese don't want to devalue. Janet doesn't want to lend directly to the Chinese in swap lines. So she's going to backdoor it via the Japanese banks by getting the Japanese to intervene. That's how I think it plays out. The Chinese, on the other hand, will have agreed the other thing because Janet is the world's largest junk bond saleswoman and she (laughs) needs them to buy bonds. So she's like, I will get you the liquidity. We understand the euro dollar market is is in supply shortage. We will give you the liquidity via different routes. You will add to your treasuries. We can all go away. And then we've seen the trade deals trying to happen where they're trying to say, listen, the US can't run such a big deficit. You know, everyone has to kind of realign here or we won't get enough growth. Everybody needs that growth. A weaker dollar is the mechanism for the world to grow. Every business cycle up cycle is all about a weak dollar cycle. It sloshes money into emerging markets. Uh, China desperately needs it. The US needs to export goods and have people buying them. Chinese won't buy any goods because they're in a recession, essentially. You know, it's all of this dance at the bottom of the business cycle feels like it's going to get resolved. And the only way I think it gets properly resolved is the Fed need to cut, lower the interest differential, kind of shock the market, maybe July. I know I think you mentioned on Twitter today. um, I have a tendency to think July or a strong signal it's coming and then give the Japanese unlimited amounts to intervene. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've seen that two or three times almost every cycle, uh, the Japanese have had to intervene in the currency markets. And then it and then what you see is the dollar falls sharply. That ignites world growth. Everybody's, you know, it's a much better situation. Yeah. 
the US have enjoyed the strong dollar in one respect, which is lowered inflation, but it lowers exports, which is why they're running a large deficit. So mm-hmm. I think everybody knows the game that needs to be played. And that's why Yellen was in China for no other reason. GDP growth is driven by a magic formula. It's really simple and every economist forgets it just in the mid-curving of being an economist. It's like GDP growth is driven by population growth plus productivity growth plus debt growth. Debt growth is robbing from the future. We blew that up in 2008. All debt growth now is just servicing of old debts. So population growth, productivity growth. Population growth, well, you can extrapolate that into the future. There is no population growth in the Western world. It is just shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. We got a demographic time bomb, but we know. Okay, so how do we get GDP when it gets worse and worse and worse every year? Productivity has been terrible too. Why? Because old people are very productive. No shit. You know, it's not difficult to figure this out. And then you appear into the future and say, okay, how do we stop this dynamic? Because if this continues, this whole thing continues in this weird world of debasement and cycles and all of that. And really, it's about technology. It's about the AI and the robots are infinite population. People don't get it yet, but like Amazon has gone from 250,000 robots in three years to three quarters of a million robots. Soon, it'll, it'll be got past the workforce of Amazon itself in human terms. And these things are three to 10 times more productive. So we are replacing an aging human workforce with infinite AI and robots. So what that does is makes a mockery of that magic formula. What, we can have infinite, infinite population. Well, the other side of that is okay. Well, infinite robots and AI means an infinite use of electricity and compute. So compute, everybody's solving the electricity side. Well, that is productivity. And productivity, again, I love the mid-curve take of FinTwit. It's like the Europeans have no what they're doing. They're throwing money at this stupid green energy narrative. They completely understand what they are doing is forcing down the cost of capital into innovation in lowering the cost of electricity. Because fossil fuels over the years, basically, electricity costs have been stable. We haven't really made much progress with that. But we can. We've seen the Moore's Law working in EV and solar and in wind and in geothermal and eventually in nuclear. We've got more than enough energy. It just takes time and investment in technology for storage and distribution and all of that. So the Europeans are pouring money in. People don't realize the Chinese have been doing even more. You know, the Chinese, 40% of their entire car fleet is now electric. And so they're all forcing down the cost of energy. So think of the magic formula. You're about to increase population infinitely. And you're about to, over the next 10 years, drop the cost of electricity by 75%. That multiplier is bananas. You don't need anything else to solve this. Powell argues that traditional debt-driven growth is unsustainable, often used primarily to service existing debt. Cryptocurrencies, especially Bitcoin, are increasingly viewed as a hedge against the devaluation of fiat currencies caused by excessive debt. They offer an alternative financial system that is less reliant on debt. Additionally, Powell highlights significant investments by Europe and China in green energy, which are expected to reduce energy costs and enhance productivity. Similarly, there is a growing global interest in cryptocurrencies, with many countries exploring blockchain technology for various applications. This international effort could lead to broader acceptance and integration of cryptocurrencies into the mainstream economy. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.